The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Hello, and help, help me welcome Steve. How are you, Steve? Hi, Carl. How are you? Good nice to, to see, see you, sir. Steve Negron is uh, running again for this office. Yes, sir. And he still has competition. Yep. And he's out there hustling all the voters out absolutely, there. Absolutely. Absolutely. all the Republicans know you? <laughs> and well, uh, it, how, It's uh, interesting this time, right? Because having won the nomination yeah. last time, um, one of the things that we have found out is that name recognition is a big deal in the Definitely. second congressional district, and only because it's just so geographically challenging, right? I mean, you have 93 and 89, but everything else is is rural roads to, to, mm -hmm. to traverse the uh, the uh, the district. And you know, I tell this funny story is that you know we blew two engines in our cars oh, last yeah. time, one in my suburban and one in my Subaru. So we understand how well, um, very well, how hard the district is, and. You know, in 2014, the nominee did not come back in 2016. And in 2016, the nominee did not come back in 2018. And a 2018 nominee, which was me, and here I am running again. And that's making a huge difference to a lot of people. You mm -hmm. know, it's not Definitely. like you have to get to know somebody all over again. So, you know, one of the things is uh, having run this before and having been on, on the stage and the television and radio with Ann Custer, um, nobody else in this race has done it. So we feel very good about our chances coming up on September 8th. Good. Uh, so what are you uh, doing? You has any big activities lined up or what? You sure. Got well, you know, we, uh, for the most part, and usually we started door knocking last time in the April, May, June timeframe. And that didn't happen that time for, for a lot of reasons. Um, but what we did do, we still brought all the college kids here. You know, we've got a, a lot of young, um, aggressive talent, which Good. is, I'm very blessed to have. Um, so we went out and we, we made the, the expenditure and we bought 100, um, four by eight signs. Mm. Um, and so these kids went out all over the district and, went, and 80 of them are out there uh, throughout the district. And so we hear and talk to people all the time. We saw your sign, we saw your sign. We ran out of our lawn signs already. Uh -huh. um, you know, we had to order another another batch of 2,500. So the name recognition is there. Uh, we, you know, we know we're out there now knocking doors um, with a mask um, in case that's something that the individual uh -huh. who answers sure. the door wants. Um, but what we're hearing and seeing is that, you know, even though some people may differ with me philosophically about the size and role and scope of government, mm -hmm. um, about what, what programs should or should not be done and, and what states' rights versus federal government rights are. But the one thing that is of common ground to all the um, Democrats and independents is they don't want Nashua or Keene or any other city or town or hamlet to be Portland or to be Seattle Definitely. or Chicago. Right. And so when we talk about, you know, what what... I don't even call it the Democratic Party anymore, Carl. You know, it is the left-leaning Socialist Party. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, just look at what's happening in those cities. And that's a sneak peek uh, underneath the tent about what, what wants to happen. You know, you've got this rhetoric about defunding the police. You know, it's, it's crazy talk. Um, and, and I believe our current Congresswoman, Ann Custer, you know, she has not once stood up and said anything um, against that kind of violence that's mm -hmm. happening um, in Portland and Seattle or Chicago. Um, she does say that, you know, she supports defunding the police. Um, I just don't know how somebody who's supposed to be representing the great state of New Hampshire and the New Hampshire 2nd Congressional District um, can go around as a congresswoman saying those kind of things. So she's going to have to answer to all of those and to us. Um, and I think it's going to be very difficult for her to to win her fifth term. Well, I think you got a lot of examples of problems with those uh, cities. Oh, and uh, I mean, just uh, today I heard that the district attorney, all those people they arrested in that last thing, he, di he dismissed the charge. I know. And then you just had the Seattle police chief, a female, oh, yeah. a female of color, um, just resign or will be resigning on the 1st of September. I mean, you cannot you cannot shackle the very individuals that are there mm -hmm. to, as it says, to serve and protect. And and even though I heard this this uh, this piece, that says, well, when we say defund the police, we don't really mean defund them. And so, you know, you go to Webster's or Funk and Wagnalls and you look at what <coughs> defund says and it's very clear mm -hmm. what defund says. You know, if I've got one hundred dollars, you take away 20. I don't care what you want to call it. Yeah. You've actually defunded <laughs> the police. And then to 
spread this money out to other agencies which they feel are better equipped to do those kinds of things instead of the police force. So I think what happened, you know, uh, we had this unfortunate circumstance that, that, that happened. Uh, I believe that, you know, that individual should be uh, held accountable. But I think what you see is an opportunity for people to make an indictment against an institution mm-hmm. like the, the police force and the brave men and women of our of our police force, both local, state, and and, uh, and I think that's just wrong. And I think just using it as a target of opportunity to get a message across. Well, and you're being welcomed in when you're knocking on doors. Absolutely, like there that. isn't. I can tell you probably, like I said, we probably hit on over seventeen thousand doors this time. Um, there's probably been a handful of people that a wouldn't open the door or wouldn't want to talk to us. And and I think that you know these young kids that are, that are out there are the pointy end of the spear. Yeah. You know, they're out there reaching and talking to people. And quite frankly, Carl, these people, these, most of these individuals have been locked up in their homes. I think it's kind of nice to have a nice different dialogue with somebody that, that's mm-hmm. out there, non-controversial, non-adversarial, just asking them some questions. And, and we're seeing a lot of positive feedback from Good. that, from knocking on these doors. So you're getting the part of the uh, younger people that uh, are really conservative th- thinkers. Uh, because everybody in the, in the papers is saying, you know, eighty percent of uh, the millennials or whatever they're called right. now uh, are, are liberal. You know, and, and I got to tell you, there's a there, there's probably a, some truth to that. When you look at the universities today, oh, you yeah. know, it isn't it isn't education anymore; it's indoctrination. You know, and voices, conservative voices, are the ones that are not being allowed to speak on campuses. Mm-hmm. You know, you have very famous um, guest speakers that are not allowed to come onto a campus. And we have a, 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 a phenomenal uh, young lady who actually graduated this May from UCLA. And she flew cross country and she's working on our campaign right very now. Good. So she's originally from Oregon, from the Portland area and spent the last two years at UCLA. So she's a great data point for me to talk to oh, yeah. as to what was it like in California? What was it like in Portland? And she can't believe how we do politics here in the great state of New Hampshire. Yeah. She's like, we're really going to go knock on doors? Yep, we're going to go knock on doors and they're going to ask you some tough questions. It's going to be like a job interview. And you better know where I stand because they're going to put you to the test. Mm-hmm. And she's, she goes, you know what? We talked about this and we learned about it in books, but we never saw it in California. It's everything by television or radio or, or, you know, or mail. But here we actually go out and talk to the voters. I said, it's retail politics. In mm-hmm. this great state, that's mm-hmm. the way it is. Mm-hmm. And she's mm-hmm. absolutely been uh, a phenomenal plus to the, to the campaign. Plus, we got two, two recent graduates, both from Nashua, one from uh, SNU, uh, and another one from uh, a school down in Boston. And, and it's just amazing. And we've got kids Good. from... Yeah, I said, good. That it is. is. It's, 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 and, it, and they're a breath of fresh air. It's, it's tough yeah, to, yeah. To, teak up, uh, to keep up with them. Um, but, you know, it is uh, Tyler Gouveia, a uh, young man with us, just graduated from Suffolk. Um, and he's also running as a state representative right. here in National Ward 9. So, you know, are there individuals that are their age that, that don't believe the way we do? Sure. But I got to tell you, the people that I've been seeing and meeting these young kids, they've got a fire in their belly and they're willing to... To, to fight, um, to keep this country the way I remember it, the mm-hmm. way you remember it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's very refreshing uh, to have them on the team. Well, that's good because the schools are getting, you know, some of them don't allow any kind of, uh, you know, public speaking. They don't. And, you know, I have a daughter um, who is a senior in college um, down in Texas, which you would think is a strong, traditional, right. conservative um, red state. But we saw the fight that, that Senator Cruz had with Beto O'Rourke. Sure. Um, in the Senate race. So, you know, you, you kind of want to raise an eyebrow as to, as to what's happening. And, you know, my daughter goes to the same university that I went to, Texas Christian University uh-huh. in Fort Worth. And, and she tells me that there are situations where, as I said earlier, um, other, t- other types of speakers are welcome with open arms, uh, but conservative um, leaning individuals um, it's more of a, a, a difficulty for them to, uh-huh. to come on, on, on campus. So, you know, I, I just think that, you know, we have, an, we have to have an ability for anybody to come on campus uh, and speak and let, the, and let the students decide yeah. on what it is. It shouldn't be something done by the administration at the universities. Yeah, too many. I, don't look at, I guess it's the administrations that are causing that. Uh, they just have an overwhelming 90 percent plus uh, liberal. Oh, absolutely. A, a, it, it, that is so true. You know, and it's, it's hard to understand where they, where they come from, you know, because they probably have had opportunities 
um, to be able to, to teach at a university, um, to get tenure at a university, you know, that didn't come for free. You right. know, there were people um, that worked hard to allow them to have that ability to do such a thing and, uh, and to, to kind of like go completely against that ability for an individual to speak freely and think freely, um, I think is, is a bit a bit scary what's going on in the institutions. It's changed across. fast in the last 20 years. Hasn't I don't it know. though? Because I was down in Texas at the 90s and uh, I, I got a very conservative attitude uh, that I saw the, all the places that uh, I went. Right. And right. Uh, the, even the young people that we hired were fairly conservative. Right. It, is, it has been a, a whirlwind uh, over the last 20 years. I, I couldn't agree more. And you try to sit back and say, how, how did that happen? Well, it happens because you get the media that all of a sudden silences the voices of other counter mm -hmm. uh, counter issue, mm -hmm. you know, counter mm -hmm. points of view. Um, and you look at it now and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it's an indictment against all of media, but you have to ask yourself, you know, why, why is it that when something is good is done by the president or by Congress, doesn't get any airtime at all. Um, but when all of a sudden somebody has a gaffe or there's a big contentious issue, that's all that you hear over the airwave. So, you know, I believe that we, we're in a fight right now, Carl. I think mm -hmm. we're in a fight for the very um, essence of who we are as a country, you know, as our, as we say, you know, we're a constitutional republic um, and, and we need to fight to keep it that way. And as I often talk when I speak, you know, if this is such a terrible country and people want to change it, why are so many people trying to come here? Right. Yeah. right? Because we're the last beacon of hope. You know, right. this is truly where freedom is. But I believe it was Ronald Reagan that said, you know, so famously, we're only one generation away mm -hmm. uh, from losing freedom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why we're, we're in this fight and we're in it again. Yeah. Uh, and for everybody that's running in Nashua, you know, we, we need to get some of these seats back. You know, we're represented completely mm -hmm. um, by by Democrats, uh, 27 out of 27. And you see some of the stuff that's happening to our city. And I think it's time for us to take some of it back. Well, it's, it's a very in uh, interesting problem. I don't know what's really uh, turning it, though. You say it, the media is one of them. I, I, I believe that, too. And the fact that the uh, the more liberal stations use the same language. Uh, I don't know if you've tuned in. Uh, I've seen Fox that. Yeah, you see, see them showing three different stations with using the same exact words? Oh, same words. I mean, there's <laughs> not even you know. Usually, I remember that that was called plagiarism right. um, well, when I was going through school. But it is true, and I and I believe that you know we we you know we need to build our future right. again. You know, prior to this COVID nineteen happening, you had to look at where where we were from an economic standpoint from an unemployment standpoint, not just across the board, but for Hispanics and blacks and women, you know, we were, we were making numbers that were just mm -hmm. off the charts. Right. And, and, and all of a sudden this hit and it was a gut punch. You know, there's, there's absolutely no doubt that it put the brakes on this wonderful recovery that we have. But I believe that, you know, this recovery is, is still going to continue. You know, the, you look at the Dow and the S and P and the NASDAQ, you know, it's, it's climbing. Um, back up to where it was. Even some of the other numbers too, the in employment, they're coming back faster than they thought. They, they are. You know, to. I think it was in July, we had a 1.9 million jobs, yeah. you know, to the economy. So it, I, I think the problem that we see is that we as conservatives, we want to tell people that there's hope, that there's a way through this pandemic, um, that you, you need to trust um, in the process and things that are going around. And I think a lot of times the people that don't believe like us, they want to they want to have this culture of fear. Yeah. You know, don't don't go out. Um, don't do this. Don't shake hands. You have to wear a mask. Now, the mask thing, I was asked about this thing the other day. If I go to a proprietor's place of business and that's what he or she wants, and I want to spend my money there, then I will comply. Yeah, sure. Right? But that's my personal decision. Right. right. It isn't something that should be mandated to me. If I don't want to walk in that store then I, as an individual, don't have to walk in that store. Mm -hmm. I'll go to another mm -hmm. store, mm -hmm. but let that be my decision, mm -hmm. right? Um, do I believe that there is a universe of people that are more susceptible to this? Clearly. You mm -hmm. know, when I go to church, I wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And I wear a mask because out of respect of the people that, that I'm with in my church, which are elderly. Um, but it isn't because somebody told me to do that. Is it because I respect that the situation. Lacking any of that, you know, I think we've, we've lost our way. There's a great picture that showed one Australian sheepdog um, in front of a hundred sheep and the sheep aren't moving. And the caption was, how does one dog control 100 sheep? And at the bottom of it was fear. And it's fear. And I think that's what's happened to us right now. We've become paralyzed with fear. Uh, we're afraid of things of the unknown. And, and quite frankly, I don't subscribe to that. You mm -hmm. know, I believe when people talk about the number of cases of COVID, 
Um, my issue is give me the mortality rate. What is the number of deaths from this right. thing? And it's upside down. But right. nobody wants to talk about that because right. then some people believe, well, maybe it isn't as draconian as some people are making it out to be. So, you know, we believe that 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 the Republican way is is to be cautious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our governor just put out a mandate, more than 100 people. It's a mandatory mask, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wearing requirement now. Um, I, I, I just think that when, when government becomes heavy handed, you know, and you look at other places that well, weren't as heavy handed. Well, that's the safety thing that they talk to you about. You know, big daddy government's going to take care of you. Don't right. worry about it. Right. Who's going to pay for all that stuff? Oh, clearly. Uh, is it all needed? As you say, right. the, the restrictions are sometimes a little bit too tight. Right. When you talk about the size of a crowd, for example, it should be in reference to how many people could be held in that. You know, if it's a large church or a small church, it right. should be different numbers. Absolutely. Ab absolutely. And the same thing with any kind of uh, get together. Right. And I, and I think that's, you know, certainly my opponent um, in Congresswoman Custer, you know, she she always talks about, you know, those things and reinforces don't go out, stay at home, you know, your mm -hmm. social distancing. And that's I don't even know if the word social distancing was even around prior to this COVID thing. But I, I believe, honestly, that, you know, that we we have independent thought. We have our own liberties. You know, let me be responsible right. for me. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, of course, in the counter is well, you're you're putting people at danger. Well, then then you stay home. Yeah. If you're so fearful, mm -hmm. then you stay home. Mm -hmm. Right. Let that be your decision. Right. And and I think, you know, I, I think what uh, Congresswoman Custer is hoping that this whole COVID-19 is going to be the smokescreen. And she wants us to forget all the things that she did prior prior to this happening. But I can tell you, Carl, we're going to be the ones to to bring those up about her her custer cronyism, right, where she she does everything Nancy Pelosi tells her to do. Um, you know, one of the things that I talk about, too, is that, pr you know, prior to the COVID-19 hitting, um, you know, she backed Pete Buttigieg mm -hmm. um, in the Democratic presidential primary here. Um, and then when I went and looked at what Mayor Pete was was all about and some of his planks, he's he wanted to abolish the Electoral College. So I asked myself, I say, so here comes our congresswoman who's supporting a president who wants to abolish the Electoral College. And really, you look at a small state like New Hampshire, our first in the nation, if we had no Electoral College, our first in the nation status would go away. Our role in a presidential um, election in the year would go away. Nobody would come back to the state. Mm -hmm. We only have four electoral votes. Um, so how does a congresswoman put her head on the pillow at night? You know, she should be fighting for us instead of throwing us underneath the bus. So I think she wants to, to hope that we forget about all the things um, that she did prior mm -hmm, to COVID-19, mm -hmm. but it'll be, it'll be our job and our, and our responsibility to remind voters of, of what was happening prior to COVID-19 happening. And again, the, talking about uh, uh, Notre Dame and that area, uh, the, they did not run very good the government. No, been. you know, a lot of people and, came out and said, you know, he's I mean, he came out of nowhere, you right. know, Mayor Pete and he, he was like the the shiny object. Um, but when you go back to the to the town that he came from, there was a, there was a lot of issues there oh, yeah. um, out of his town of South Bend, Indiana, aside from the fact that Notre Dame uh, <laughs> is there. Um, but, you know, it's it's just that, you know, I think she wanted to, to back somebody that was that she thought could have been that rising star. Um, without realizing that, you know what, is that, is that really the person that you want to, you want to back? And how does that affect the state that you're supposed to be representing? Right. Right. And, uh, and I think it's a situation that we're, we're going to remind people, uh, of the things that of her judgment, uh, of That's her judgment. What you're talking Absolutely. About, about you know, and, and not to forget that she also impeached our president, right? You know, right. um, and, and that's falling apart. <laughs> sure. I mean, that it was so funny when that, when that came out and, and, um, and they were talking about what's happening with the Ukraine. I actually took the time to pull down the treaty between the United States oh, and the Ukraine, mm -hmm. and I read it. Uh -huh. It's a small read, 16 to 18 pages. And not only did our president do the right thing, because he's a steward of taxpayer right. dollars, right. and he wants to make sure that it's going for the intended purpose, mm -hmm. he's required to do so by this treaty. Mm -hmm. And then this whole flap about Attorney General Barr being over there, mm -hmm. The treaty requires that the attorney general be the, the, the main law enforcement officer mm -hmm. to ensure those things are being met. And then you go through the treaty, Carl, and at the very, the very last page is the thing that struck me the most. This treaty was actually signed by Vice President Al Gore. <laughs> I right. forgot so, that. So it did get started back then. Yeah, yes. and it was. So the question should be, 
Yeah. What did the Clinton administration do? Yeah. What did the Bush administration right. do? What did the Obama administration do? Right. All of a sudden now we have a president that's actually enforcing mm -hmm. the mechanism mm -hmm. that the State Department and Congress gave him, and all of a sudden now it's wrong. It just stinks to me, yeah. right? And so I bet you that nobody in any of those judiciary committees or the, the, the House Intelligence Committee ever took the time to read the treaty mm -hmm. and say, did the mm -hmm. president act within the guidelines of what this treaty requires him to do? Yeah. And the answer is, no, they didn't read it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely did mm -hmm. not read it. And we're going to ask her that question. You know, how do you, how do you reconcile with the first article of impeachment was abuse of power yeah. when, in fact, the power was granted to him by you? by Congress. So it's going to be an interesting discussion when I get on the stage with, and, with Congressman Custer. And her Custer. time under the Obama administration? Nobody too? spoke anything. I mean, you know, that this, 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 this corruption in the Ukraine did not just surface, right? But it was okay in the previous administration because nobody squawked about That's it. That's right. Now, all of a sudden, you put a spotlight on it and you're questioning uh -huh. about it. And all of a sudden, now he's using it for his own political benefits. You know what? He's the president of the United States responsible for taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. The sole person is responsible for uh, foreign uh, foreign affairs, and he did exactly what he was supposed to do, but yet this Congress went into impeachment. And oh, let's not forget, Speaker Pelosi said she would not move forward unless there was bipartisan support. Right. We know what the numbers were. <laughs> <laughs> that. But I gotta tell you, Carl, she has to answer to all of that. I mean, yeah. how, did, how can somebody get away with some blatant uh, statements like that? I, I, uh, you know, it's ridiculous. It, it, it is ridiculous. People and people even are believing that. And yeah. nobody, and quite frankly, I don't think nobody pushes back. Yeah, that's I don't right. think nobody identifies it, you know, and, and we're going to give her all the time in the world um, to be able to explain herself. Mm -hmm. uh, and not just to me, to every person in the second congressional district, you know, how is it that you felt that that was a righteous vote mm -hmm. for you? I mean, even though you tell us it was the hardest decision you've ever made, quite frankly, you know, I think it was the easy decision because... Speaker Pelosi told you to vote that way. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what soul she searching she had to do. This 116th Congress, Carl, she has voted with Nancy Pelosi, one, not even 99.9, 99.8, 100% of the time um, mm -hmm. with the Speaker. To the detriment, in my opinion, to the detriment of the constituents of the 2nd Congressional District. But, you know, and that's... how much legislation did she generate? You know, I, I've <laughs> done a lot of studying about Congresswoman Custer. She's had four bills... Um, that she's been a prime sponsor on in over 2,600 days in office. And two of them were bridge naming. Uh, one of them was for the FAA Tower here in Nashua. Oh, really? Right there on Northeastern Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I don't remember what the fourth one was. Mm -hmm. But she touts bipartisanship. You know, she touts working across the aisle. Um, I just don't see it. And so this time, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna call her on it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and we're going to make her have to answer to the people of the second congressional because quite frankly i think four terms it's it's enough you know and, it, and it's time to retire well, she, her she's home. a spender too i mean she there's not a bill that she doesn't <laughs> want to support you know even even these these uh, packages uh, for the for the covid uh relief packages yeah, yeah. you know the stuff that they try to stuff in there was stuff that they couldn't get through through the normal process that's right and to me the limits must be very simple does this help those affected by the covid uh, 19 crisis. Um, if it is, great, let's talk about it and the amount. If it isn't, why is it even in here? Get it out, you know, and there's just stuff upon stuff upon stuff. Oh, yeah. She um, wants that to was in pay there. off the pension problems in three states. That oh, they, yeah. They, they, and, and to support the, the Postal Service, right. you know, and to get them out of debt. And she wants to fix cities that had bad financial uh, right. decision making. I mean, look, we're, we're in a tough spot as it is, there's small businesses out there that require and they need this, mm -hmm. you know, just to get them over the hump to be able to be, uh, to be able to come back. You know, I had to lay people off in mm -hmm. my business. Mm -hmm. You know, I get that. Um, but the problem is that you can't, you can't make people so dependent on the government so mm -hmm. that now I know of business owners that they can't hire people now that they're trying to get back because people want to stay at home. They're making as much sure. money yeah. staying at home with unemployment checks than they were when they're working. You know, that just breeds a generation of people that are dependent on, on the government and you stay at home, what do I need to go? I can just stay at home and get paid. I disagree with that completely. You know, you have to have an incentive for people to get off of it, right. um, which allows me as a small business owner to start hiring again, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and small business is the backbone and the engine of not only just New Hampshire, 
but this country. And you got to you got to maybe uh, reduce some restrictions on, on small business to get, mm-hmm. get that engine mm-hmm. going yeah, again. And it absolutely. will. All you have to do is look oh, at yeah. the two and a half, three years prior to COVID mm-hmm. and look at the economy that we had. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. it was it was smoking. Right. Right. And we can do that again. But yeah, yeah, you got to take the shackles off of us. You can't let people become so dependent on government handouts um, because then they'll never get back to work. And mm-hmm. we're seeing that right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Well, you're uh, aiming for a debate uh, as, as soon as the uh, Absolutely. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a primary debate that's supposed to, uh, we're going to oh. tape it September 2nd. Okay. Uh, it's going to air September 3rd. Mm-hmm. Um, again, nothing in person. Uh, this will all be taped and then and then televised the day after. Um, and then we'll have... I don't know if we'll, it'll probably be call-ins and whatever, but we're going to push to be opposite ends of the microphone or the, or the, or the camera or on stage, whatever, um, with Ann Custer, because we're going to, we're going to be out there and we're going to be making her a little nervous, right? Because she knows her record. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know her record. Um, and we're going to make the people of the second congressional know that, look, this campaign that we have right now, Carl, it's, it's about, we're worried prior to COVID-19. Let's build our future. Right. Let's tell people that there is a way forward um, that isn't as doom and gloom as some people want you to believe. And we have we we do have a path forward. It's going to it's going to take work on everybody. You know, good old fashioned Mm -hmm. Yankee Yankee effort um, for us in the Northeast. But I think there's a path for us to get back together. So we're really Mm -hmm. looking forward to it. Well, we're running out of time, but I have one more question. Yes, sir. What role do you think the undeclared are going to play in this election? Huge. Okay. huge. And that's why we're reaching out to them. Okay. You know, we uh, I think the people are looking at things now, not in a, in a bipartisan fa- uh, faction. I think they're looking at it as where's our country fundamentally? Mm-hmm. Where does our country need to go? And that, quite frankly, is independent of traditional party of Democrat and Republican. We do see this loud faction that's out there that's trying to steer this boat. Right. But we're pretty resilient. We're pretty smart. And we think we're going to get back on track. Good. Well, You've told me a lot. I hope <laughs> <laughs> the people that are listening uh, are, are, are going to vote the right way. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come on here and talk with you, Carl. And we're going to do it again right after the, uh, so we, before the final yes, election sir. in November. Yep. And uh, good luck. Thank you, Carl. Thank and, you very much. Uh, I hope people out there, you're listening in, uh, let's support your candidates now. If you like what Steve's saying, come out and help him get the vote. Right. You want to live better? Get the vote. (laughs) Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carl. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.